One thing is, when, when we look at um, the various forces, say the weak interaction, strong interaction, and electromagnetism, um, they, at the energies that we tend to see things, the energies we experience, they appear to be very different forces. Um, we know as electromagnetism gives rise to a long-range force. Whereas we know about the weak interactions, the weak interactions, for example, lead to nuclear decay. That's one of their places they occur. They also occur in the sun. Um, but it's a very short-range force. It really seems quite different. Um, and also strong interactions seem extraordinarily different because they're, in fact, so strong that you can't even isolate um, the particles that carry the strong force. So ironically, one of the reasons we didn't see the strong force was because it's so strong that we don't see charged objects that are charged under the strong force. Now, this is all true at low energy, but when we go to higher energy, the forces begin to look more similar. Um, and if, if, if you go to energies around um, 100, I measure in GED, so about the mass of the W or the Z, which is about 100 times heavier than the proton mass, um, the forces are beginning to look more similar there. They still don't have exactly the same strength, but they all seem to be qualitatively the same. They sort of all look like they mediate fairly long-range force on, on that scale. But then um, you can extrapolate to even higher energy. And I should say we, we actually know a precise procedure for finding out um, how interactions depend on distance or energy. And if we went ahead and extrapolate to higher energy, we find that in the standard model, all the forces have roughly the same um, strength. But if you actually go to extensions of the standard model, and we'll talk later about why we might believe there is more to physics than the standard model. And by the standard model, I mean the standard model of particle physics that includes three, three forces and the known quarks and leptons which interact under these forces. But if we extrapolate to high energy, it looks like the forces have really can have the same strength, especially in extensions of the standard model. So, um, although I mentioned the fact that gravity looks different um, because it's weak, there's another uh, problem with gravity that I didn't mention, which is just that uh, we don't really know completely how to make a quantum theory of gravity, at least certainly not without string theory. It looks like when you're trying to make a theory that has both quantum mechanics and general relativity in it, um, you just run into trouble at um, sh short distance, for example. Where, because it, at sh basically, the, at, at low energies, we, we usually don't notice this problem because you either are in a domain where either gravity is important or you're in a domain where quantum mechanics is important. And if, if one is small compared to the other, we don't have to worry about it. But if you go to a regime where both are important, we don't have a theory that, um, certainly the certainly theory without string theory, string theory doesn't, work. doesn't work. It just seems that just both forces both are trying to, trying to um, do their um, thing and they're, they're just incompatible. They're incompatible. However, if, However you if you have the string theory, 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 if you, if instead you, of assuming, assuming, like we do in like particle physics, physics, that the fundamental objects are particles, which is to say point-like objects, if you assume that the fundamental objects are strings, which is to say slightly extended objects that look like strings, um, it, it seems that these problems can be um, ameliorated. We don't completely know how to combine quantum mechanics and gravity because we don't completely know how string theory really works. But it does look like it's a theory that can consistently contain both quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, of course, of course, it really does that um, in, in a theory with many more dimensions of space than we have, um, 10 or even 11 um, total dimensions, which is just a 9 or 10 spatial dimension. So it, it, it's certainly gravity, but it's not naively uh, the gravity we expect. And so there are many challenges that still remain, although it does look like it's a theory with both quantum mechanics and gravity. We want to make sure it's uh, gravity as we know it, which means we'd like to understand um, how we have three spatial dimensions, for one thing. And also we'd like to understand, see it solve um, some of the problems that a theory that has both quantum mechanics and gravity is supposed to solve. And um, we still have a long way to go in really fully um, understanding all of the string theory and education. Um, um, so, of course, so of course, if the theory really had um, nine, dimensions nine dimensions of space of that space were that accessible were to us, that we could see, that we could observe, that, we could observe. Um, um, but that would be a problem. Be a problem. <laughs> it's clearly it's not really the, not the world, world in which we live. We live. So there's a question, can you have a theory that looks like um, at very high energy, for example, that it really does have um, these additional dimensions, but say at the energies at which we experience things or can do our measurements, um, we just wouldn't see them. And although that sounds a little bit far-fetched, it's actually a very simple thing to actually imagine. Um, for example, when you look at a piece of string, for, for example, it looks 
you know that it's really a three-dimensional object, but if you hold it very far away, it certainly looks like a one-dimensional object. You really see it as having one dimension in which it's extended, and the others you might as well think of it as point-like. And that's sort of a general idea that um, if you have extra dimensions that are somehow curled up or small in size, if you have dimensions that are small, if you look at, at big, if you're only measuring things with a sensitivity to, say, larger distances, then you don't necessarily see all the structure that there might be at very short distance. So, for example, if you're a bug on a string, you would actually be able to see it as three-dimensional. Or if you're as a person far away, you see it as one-dimensional. And in a similar way, it's possible that um, the superfluous spatial dimensions are curled up to a small size. Um, so that everywhere there really are those dimensions, but we just don't see them. We just don't have the resolution to be able to um, make out the fact that there are those dimensions. And I should say that that was sort of the the old theory, and it's, it's known as, uh, well, basically there's a clue time theory based on this, when we curl up the dimensions. Um, and actually one of the exciting things that Raman Sundrum and I actually found was that there is an alternative, um, but we can get into that later. Um, well, I, I'm not... M theory really has the string theory in it, but I think what what's actually very important that sort of M theory brought home to us more is that um, string theory itself isn't just the theory of strings, but actually is a theory that has not just strings but membranes. And all strings are objects that are extended in one dimension, one dimension. Whereas you could have these objects that we call brains, which are like membranes, um, that are in the string theory, and they can be extended in more dimensions. Um, so you can have brains of various dimensionality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, you can imagine, say, a curtain um, in your house, which is um, a two-dimensional object in a three-dimensional room. And one reason these brains are important, at least from my perspective, is that, is that um, there's actually mechanisms in string theory.